السلام عليكم एवरीवन بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسوله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. I can't believe it, but we have come to the final session of our Women in Quran series with Dr. Salim Ibrahim. We've had a really an excellent run uh, where we've, alhamdulillah, learned so much about all of these uh, mother figures, wives, sisters, um, ladies in the Quran. And Jazakallah khair so much, uh, Sister Salim, for educating us about all of these people. And this blessed month of Ramadan, you know, may Allah increase you and uh, your family for all of the wonderful knowledge that you have imparted on us. And inshallah, we will continue this collaboration uh, after Ramadan, maybe find a different kind of uh, series that you can, you know, do a halaka with us on. Um, and just so that you know, you know, what we're finding is that sometimes in Ramadan, uh, it may be difficult for people to uh, engage live, but there's a lot of engagement afterwards with all of the videos that are posted. So that's a very positive sign as well. Um, so Jazakallah Khair once again, and uh, I'll open up the floor to you. And, and just to remind everyone um, at this time that you can post questions in that uh, that little the section there. And please keep your questions as well for us at the end. And the final thing to remind everybody is that the uh, ICB fundraiser is ongoing. We're doing it virtual this year. You will have emails, so we're not pushing you, but we just would like to remind you to please do donate because it's your donations that keep you know these wonderful programs like this one that we're about to hear from going. So please do donate generously in this month of Ramadan. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Wa Salatu Wa Salam Ala Rasulillah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Alameen May God's peace and blessings be upon all of you Jazakumullah Khairan uh, Thanks be to God that we're here together I think many people are celebrating Passover tonight and so greetings to all of those who are celebrating but might be watching this video later uh, We wish you a happy Passover Inshallah today, it's a bit of series highlights, but I still have some material from the last section that I wanted to get into. So without further ado, I'm going to jump us right in. And then also today, we're going to be discussing Hurain, which are the heavenly beings in paradise. So that's uh, on the agenda for tonight. I wanted to start by reminding us of some verses that we've already seen. Here's the English translations on the screen here. So these are all different times, different women figures, a girl figure in one case, who speak with wit and intelligence and they're, when they're under pressure, they can kind of deliver, showing us how women in the Quran are portrayed with a lot of intellectual might. So we saw last week when we looked at the Queen of Sheba, how she negotiated with her diplomatic entourage and her advisors and uh, eventually evaded war. And so here she is, this is a, a quote from her, uh, from the Quran, talking about reasoning with her milieu, saying what, um, you know, if they go to war, they're very likely to suffer a high cost. And so she's appealing to their sense of self-interest here. We saw down here, this is a quote from Asya, when she, the wife of Pharaoh, may God be pleased with her, when she's making a case to Pharaoh for adopting this child who will you know, later be the Pharaoh's downfall, but he does not know it yet. And then we have the girl figure who we looked at, the, the girl in the Quran who saves Moses again when he's in the palace and it doesn't have nursemaids. She suggests, shall I direct you to a people of the house who will take good care of him for you and treat him with goodwill? Now, of course, she's thinking of her own mother and her own house, but uh, she thinks on her feet, confronts these palace guards as this young Hebrew uh, girl. Uh, so we can appreciate here her, her quick wittedness and her bravery. So, so far, all of these have been good examples of people thinking on their feet, women figures thinking on their feet and, and uh, just their girl. We also saw last week when we saw the, the wife of the, the Prophet Muhammad who accidentally made a mistake and uh, thought on her feet very quickly, but uh, uh, 
we looked at how she indeed fell a little short in that and how the Quran, you know, called that out, called that to, to her attention and offered her the, the means to make uh, recompense for, for the slight error of judgment. Um, we also see down here, oh, we have one more here I forgot to mention. Oh, my father, hire him. Surely the best you can hire is the strong, the trustworthy. This is when the women find Musa alayhi salam in the desert and she's uh, hoping to get married to Moses. So she, she suggests to her father to hire him. So another example of a woman kind of thinking wittily um, and, and using her speech for, for good ends. And then the last one down there, we also saw this one recently in the series. So this, it comes from the the wife of the vizier in Egypt, who, uh, although here she's example of her thinking fast, it's uh, also an example of a lying speech of a woman. So we see here for the most part, when we're looking at the kinds of things that women are saying, for the most part in the Quran, female speech is truthful, it's upright, it's honest. And on just a very few occasions, we do see, for instance, the wife of the vizier who, who does tell a lie here. I just wanted to pause and say, just as someone who deals with sacred texts all the time, it's unique to have a women's voices actually in, in the kind of in the text, in the, in the Quran, in this case, in the recitation itself. And so it's just notable that on the whole, women who do speak in, in the Quran are saying prayers to God or are, are advocating for some material good for someone else. And so you see here, all of these people are, um, all these people, all these women and, and a girl figure are in, um, in, in positions where they have to navigate life circumstances under pressure. So it's just some examples there of verses that we've looked at before. I also wanted to point out something unique about sacred history here. And this might not be as obvious for people who have not thought kind of chronologically about sacred history, which if we read the Quran, we're getting stories that aren't necessarily told in, in a, a linear fashion, in a linear order. So it makes sense that if we would stop to think about what figures are when on the trajectory of sacred history, we, we would have to think about it a little bit. But if we, if we do this and we think about the sacred history that revolves around Egypt, we see that the, in the first place, the, the Beno Israel, the, the children of Israel, go to Egypt because Joseph is you know, taken as, a, as part of a caravan and traded off, and then he's adopted in, in the house in the land of Egypt. So the, the reason that the, the, the Israelites in the first place get a foothold in Egypt is because of an adoption uh, of a Hebrew, uh, Hebrew boy. Now, Really fascinating. I, I've been showing you in this series lots of juxtapositions and, and role reversals and the like. And it is also, you know, a Hebrew boy being adopted by an Egyptian household that eventually helps take the Israelites out of, of Egypt and to the promised land, which happens to be what Jews around the world are celebrating in, in these days. So the what you see down here, I put this on for the Muslims. This is the Hebrew font. Um, the, the top word there, it says um, uh, like holiday, it's the equivalent of holiday. And then um, this word is happy. And then the word on the bottom is Passover. So um, if you, I, I'm gonna try it in Hebrew, forgive me for those who are actual Hebrew speakers, uh, but Chag Semach Pesach is my best, <laughs> best uh, effort at that. Oops. Now we've seen these verses before, but I just wanted to review them in order to make a larger point about women and social reform. So we see here, this is when Asiya convinces her husband to keep Moses, Musa alayhi salam, as an adopted child. Uh, so, you know, she says, a comfort for me and for you, don't kill him. Perhaps he may benefit us or we may adopt him as a son. This is the exact words that the wife of the vizier, the, the Egyptian, um, sorry, the, 
the Egyptian vizier says to his wife, um, not the part about do not kill him, but the part about um, perhaps he may benefit us or we might adopt him as a son. So even in the subtle language of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God the most great, is giving us this structural parallel so that we can see in these two instances that evolve around adoption and the Israelites in Egypt. So the, the Quran is sometimes very subtle in its repetitions of phrases, but when it does repeat, there's usually some type of lesson that we could draw from that. And so here's the verse where, um, verses I should say, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forbidding the Musa alayhi salam to be suckled by the foster mothers. And so Moses' sister is saying that these words, shall I direct you to the people of the house of goodwill to take care of him, uh, etc. And Again, we see after this, indeed, Allah's promise is true, but the majority of them don't know. So back here, when we saw Asya, um, you know, and they perceived not. So Asya had no notion that her act of helping to save this baby from the river was eventually going to lead you know, to a whole series of events that you know, allowed the Israelites to, to flee Egypt, right? Likewise, the, the young girl here, all she's thinking about is her brother. How am I going to get her, you know, my brother back to my mother? And so, you know, meanwhile, Allah's plan is, is you know, evolving out. And so I just wanted to, us to think about this a little bit, especially as we go about our lives. And, you know, maybe we just do an act of random kindness to for somebody. And, you know, we don't know. It might have just really you know, helped, helped them at this opportune moment when they were otherwise struggling. So we never, you know, we just do the good. Um, when a person asks, right, we just uh, reciprocate. Sometimes walking around the streets of big cities, you know, there's, there's many, many people who ask. Uh, one of the things that I've that I try to do is to give people a meal or some food. And it's just amazing the, you know, how faces light up when they just see someone, you know, who's helping them out on, on what is the hard journey. So, you know, in this month of Ramadan, a month where we're trying to extend our generosity, um, may we be people who, who do these little kindnesses and, you know, Allah has a master plan. And so sometimes we are just, you know, pieces in this, this master plan that that's unfolding. We, we can also with this verse too, I think we have to just see, you know, how brave this girl is to be, you know, in the midst of what is a genocide where people are, you know, being, as, as the Quran talks about in the beginning of Surah Al-Qasas, which is number 28, Surah 28, we see that there's, you know, there's a genocide going on. And so this is not, you know, this is not just a, a little girl skipping around. Uh, this is somebody who's risking, you know, her life, trying to save her, her brother. So it's a real act of heroism. This is a, a poem that I found that was so beautiful from this collection by Moja Kaf, who's a Syrian American poet. She's a professor at the University of Arkansas. And the book, Hajar Poems, is her extended reflection on different Quranic verses. And so here, I just, I thought I'd read this. I don't often, I haven't been reading um, much poetry or the like in this series because we've been so focused on the Quran, but I think it's valuable as a poem because as you'll see, she's really thinking about the nature of these fraught relations between two peoples, one who has political control in the land and one is who is, who, who is an oppressed um, faction. And so Miriam, although she's not named as such in the Quran, is um, the wife, I mean, sorry, the, the sister of Moses. So she is, um, we know this name from the, the Hebrew Bible tradition, and she goes on to become a, a great female leader of, of the Benu Israel, of, of the Israelites. So I'll read the poem, um, Asiya meets Miriam at the riverbank. Uh, so this is you know, presumably, uh, the, the Quran says the Ahl Faron, the, the people of Pharaoh, find Moses in the river. So sometimes people imagine it that it's Asiya herself, but the Hebrew Bible stories obviously talk about the daughter of Pharaoh finding Moses in the, the river. So there's a, a slight difference in how the stories are told between the, the Quran and the Hebrew Bible. Uh, but sometimes I like to think because the Quran says 
the the family of Pharaoh, um, I like to think that there's there's less of a discrepancy than might actually be on the surface because uh, although the Quran does not mention a daughter of Pharaoh, it does mention Ahl um, Pharaoh, uh, which which means family more broadly. Um, so um, Asiya meets Maryam at the riverbank. Maryam knows how much depends on her. She studies the basket. She braces herself to the task. Asiya meets her eye across the riverbank. People of the palace wade between them, each with an opinion. Don't trust her. She's one of them. Call your guards. But Asiya has been waiting for Maryam without knowing who Maryam will be. Asiya lifts her arm, using what authority she has left in Pharaoh's order to clear a way for Maryam's advance. Asiya knows Maryam is a messenger from the other side of the riverbank. Their hands stretch across the waters, each grasping at the fragility of what will save them. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I put that in there in our, our lecture today because I think it does capture something of that spirit of here we have two, you know, young, presumably youngish women um, collaborating on, to save this infant child um, across their different ethnic backgrounds. Um, and it just, it's, um, you know, it's easy just to read over these verses kind of very quickly as we're reading through the Mus'haf, the, the Quran. But uh, I think there's a lot in there that we can apply to our contemporary situation. And whether that's you know, people on the Southern border of the US trying to lend a hand to migrants who are you know, um, dying of thirst in the desert or you know, whether that's like Afghan refugees in Boston being, being settled here, right? Sometimes we're, we're just part of these larger political structures that we can't control, but we can help mitigate the suffering that is caused when, when there is tyranny um, in, in the land. So just a kind of larger point to think of there. From a theological angle, it's fascinating how there's a certain parallel um, in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about his watchful eye over Musa. And this is in Surah Taha, not this, this verse on the screen, but in Surah Taha, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to Musa and saying, you know, all, these are all of the ways that at every step in your journey that I watched out for you. So we'll go back to that last slide in a minute. But Surah Taha, all of these ways, all the people along Musa's, Musa's alayhi salam, his path, that helped save him and guide him. And you see here that, that it's part um, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's watchful eye over, over Musa alayhi salam. And so in a way, Allah's watchful eye over Musa is through people like the sister who you know, are watching, watching him as he flows down the river and then saving him. So uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, promises a thing like restoring Musa alayhi salam to his mother, it actually, the whole episode, as we've seen in previous weeks, it transpires, sorry, I'm going to flash ahead for a second. It transpires through all of these women figures. So it's, it's God's will being done through the actions of, of women figures. And now I'm going to show you at the beginning of Surah Al-Qasas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the we in the verse, God says, we wanted to confer favor upon those who were oppressed in the land and make them leaders and make them um, inheritors. And the actual word here um, comes from the same word as we would use for like an imam to, to be like the leader of the prayer. And warithin um, here is, this is a good translation to, to have them inherit, to have them gain kind of um, a sense of, of self-determination and political autonomy. Now, we see this, God's wanting to do this, um, to establish them in the land and show Pharaoh and his, his minister Haman and their soldiers you know, that which they had feared. To, so to show the oppressor, right? Oppressors always have all these anxieties about getting disposed. And it, you know, truly that is what happens in, in Pharaoh's case, that he is disposed. And he's disposed obviously by the very infant that his wife uh, encouraged him to, to adopt. 
And so in the beginning of Surat Al-Qasas, we have this statement uh, about a revolutionary upheaval of the social order to favor the disenfranchised. Okay, so this is verse five and then verse six. Now I wanted you to see what is verse seven. So we inspired the mother of Moses. Remember, we talked about that word inspired, how it's the same word that we use for revelation, just like the revelation of the, of the Quran. So here, um, you know, we inspired the mother of Moses, like suckle him. And so this whole social uh, revolution of letting the disenfranchised in the land become established and become the leaders, it actually starts with this mother nursing her, her child. So it's like revolution starts with just like one single woman who's you know, an ethnic minority and you know, the mother of an infant and you know, the infant is under attack. So they, you know, obviously it's, it's a story with like this very dramatic arc, but when we think about how revolutions sometimes happen, it is often just the actions of one kind of single individual, and then a lot of change can happen through one single individual. So normally I'm the kind who stresses kind of, you know, collaboration and nothing happens without a ton of collaboration. And we can see that in this, this story here, all of these women collaborating together to save this baby you know, to, to establish him and to, to give him a home and then later to give him a family. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, along the way, it's Allah's inspiring each individual to just do their, their singular part. Um, let's go. So that's, that's a little bit, I think it's easy to just focus on Moses, Musa alayhi salam, as kind of the great liberator of the Egyptian people. I mean, the, 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 Bene, the Bene Wasra'il. I'm sorry, I'm fasting today. And I don't, I don't think the sugar has quite like <laughs> circulated in my system yet. Uh, has, you know, um, saved the Bene Wasra'il from being oppressed in the, the land against the, the, the Egyptians who at that moment were, were being the oppressors. Uh, so we see that it, it, um, it actually, it takes not just Musa alayhi salam, but actually a lot of women along the way as well. So I want to shift gears a little bit. And I started our series thinking about Hawa and Adam in the garden, Adam and Eve in the garden. And I showed you how they speak in the same idiom and they say the beautiful prayers of repentance together. And so I wanted to end the series as kind of a bookend, returning us to this concept of the garden. All along the way, we've looked at spouses and the relationship between spouses in this world, both things that go well and things that go wrong. And so I wanted to now focus in on one of these major themes of the Quran, which are, is the rewards for the righteous in paradise. You see here up in the corner, this word, uh, well, it's, it's actually part of a verse here, but the word hur, ayn. Um, so hur is, it can mean a lot of different things in Arabic, but generally it means um, rounded. And then ayn is eyes. So this is like rounded eyes. Um, what comes to mind is sort of the like cartoon figures that have like very rounded eyes, or you know, we see oftentimes the, the eyes of something when they're big, it makes it look um, attractive. So we're gonna talk a little bit about this concept of hur'ayn in, in the Qur'an, these wide-eyed beings that are occasionally mentioned. Now, here's a, this is a, a manuscript detail from uh, a, a Kashmiri manuscript painted around um, the turn of the, the 19th century, currently in the Library of France. But what you see there is what you see that's very typical of a lot of descriptions of paradise. You see all of these woman-like figures and you know it looks like this might be a man surrounded by all these women figures and so it's very very common that depictions of paradise I could list like many many manuscripts that have these types of of descriptions are focused on um kind of male a male surrounded by all of these uh, celestial females now we have to ask when we come to the Quran we do see mention of the, the Hurain, and we're gonna look at some of the terminology a little bit closer. But before we do that, I wanted to show you this cartoon that 
I think it was probably intended as something very Islamophobic, but it actually makes me laugh a little bit because it does give rise, uh, give voice to this paradox of, you know, how how can you have um, um, uh, sexual relations in in paradise with kind of like an unlimited number of, of virgins? It's kind of of uh, a little bit mocking the trope, but as I was doing my research, I also was thinking along a similar line, sort of what does this, what does the language and imagery around uh, virgins in paradise, what is, you know, where where is the Quran, where is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going with that language in the, in the Quran? Um, so the, the comment here, so we, we Horis are celestial virgins and we intend to remain that way. Here, why don't you recline on a jeweled couch, which is you know, one of the, not necessarily jeweled uh, in the Quran, but the Quran does talk about couches in, in, in paradise. So what happens, you know, we, here's the popular trope, both from the Muslim side and a pious Muslim you know, depiction of, of, of paradise that's meant to inspire um, believers and here kind of this mocking, um, you know, Islamophobic trope, but but both of them kind of getting at this like the male aspirations for for paradise. So when we actually go to the Quran and take a look at the language that's in there, we see that there's not just language about these hurain, which it, you you notice in that you know wide eyed. Right? There's no word that means woman in that phrase. And that's the case when we look at a lot of the language, that the language is oftentimes talking about um, spouses here, pure spouses. And in, in Arabic, the word spouse, just like in English, it doesn't tell you the gender of a person. So we have there's a lot of promises of, uh, of um uh, of companionship in the Quran that are not focused uh, specifically on male desire that that are um, egalitarian in that way. Um, we see here the verses that mention hurain. Um, we see uh, the, this another description of those of restrained glances, which again at its surface is is just it's a description. It doesn't say kind of women or maidens of restrained glances. Um, tarf. Now, um, restrained glances, if we think about Islamic ethics, we're constantly men and women required to lower the gaze if we see something that's sexually enticing, that's not appropriate for us. And so the, the women, um, you know, women and men in, in an earthly realm are required to be people of restrained glances. So even this this is not being of restrained glances is not something that only pertains to to um, female figures at all. It's a as I've pointed out in other points of the series, many times where you have a specific value or virtue that's mentioned, it's actually mentioned for across genders. So this is another example of of the, the Quran using a value or a virtue that is both for um, like a masculine audience and a, and a feminine audience. We also see the good and beautiful ones, um, the hur secluded in pavilions. And then we have a word here that means, um, it can mean virgins. Uh, virgins itself in the English, actually we think maybe in a cultural sense, we typically think um, women, but obviously men can, can be virgins too, boys can be virgins. Um, Abakarun, the way it's used is more like an adjectival sense in, in the Quran here. And I argue in my research and in my work that this is pointing to a particular phase in life because the, a lot of the Quranic imagery is about in, in paradise is about youthfulness. And so I think this term as it's used in the, in the Quran is meaning um, something like as it's also used in, in Arabic, classical Arabic, to mean kind of youthful. And we also have these words, urban um, atraban, uh, in the Quran to describe heavenly beings. And um, uh, this is, you know, I, I translate it as amorous peers. So like loving peers, right? And, and again, we see there is a sort of um, egalitarianism in, in having a peer that is loving. And um, 
Kwaeba'atraban, this uh, word here is typically used to mean the time in a girl's life when she first starts going into to puberty. So that's why it's called adolescent-like peers. You see that same word here, atraban. It's used in kind of an adjectival sense too here. So you, you, you get a sense of actually when we look at the Quranic language, and I didn't uh, put on this slide yet, the language that refers to wildan, so a walid in, in, in like regular Arabic usage is a boy, a walid. Um, so wildan is this idea of it could be just boys or it could be a more general term for youthful people because the plural can in Arabic can include the, the both, um, both genders. Um, and we also have mentions of ghulman. Um, so the ghulm the, and the ghulman. Uh, so those are also in some of these same surahs here that are talking about paradisal beings. So if, and this is my contention, if it were that women were painting a lot of manuscripts, they might be painting in manuscripts about all of the wildan who are kind of serving them on beautiful platters and, and the like. So although popular culture doesn't represent it uh, equally, the Quran is actually giving a very uh, broad description of the rewards that believers will get in paradise. And in my reading, it doesn't overly focus on kind of a, a, the masculine desire for uh, women-like figures. The most interesting thing I found, I think, when I was looking very closely at the language in the Quran was that the word, none of the words that mean women like Nisa or like um, Mara, Imra, none of those words are actually used to refer to the beings of paradise. So I don't even call them women um, in my research because the Quran doesn't call them women. It has all of these other descriptive, this other descriptive language, but it never talks about uh, women uh, per se uh, in, in those terms. So my, my thinking is that women and men are earthly beings in, in terms of what the Quran just itself describes, and that whatever is in paradise that awaits the believer is a semblance of what is on earth, but we can't understand it in the same, the same terms. And so I'll leave you with this thought. Um, oh, and I should also say that the Quran, when it talks about paradise, it talks about the beings of paradise eating and drinking wine that doesn't intoxicate and um, you know, reclining on couches and the like. So there's very, very sensual imagery, but nowhere does it actually talk directly about sexual intercourse in terms of beings in paradise. But we can contrast this because we have stories and parables and even um, legal verses that talk very directly about uh, intercourse. So it's not like the Quran is shying away from these topics. It's just notable that nowhere does it directly uh, say, does it directly give, give a verse that, that explicitly mentions something like sexual intercourse in paradise. Uh, but in the end, we just have to say, uh, we have to say exactly as the Quran says, so a soul doesn't know what is hidden for, you know, for, for them. And so here it's nefsun, which is like a soul or a, an individual, even you could say. Um, so no soul knows um, what is hidden for them. Um, of the delights of the eye. So again, we saw the Hurain, and here we have Qurrat al Ain. So in here, the verse on the bottom shows you an instance here of, um, so essentially to go around them, going around them are wilden, um, eternal youth, essentially, is how you could translate that verse down there. So it's another instance of eternal youth being mentioned. So we just ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, we strive for paradise and um, inshallah will, you know, this month in particular is a beautiful time of striving. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
help us pile on good deeds and help us shed off all of those negative qualities. And um, may we be um, you know, blessed uh, in, in beautiful company, both here on the earth and um, in paradise, inshallah. And I look forward to you know, hearing your, your, your questions, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. And once again, thank you so much for that uh, very detailed analysis and a good, very good summary. Um, I, I'll open it up to the floor to see if anyone has any questions uh, at this time. So, Sister Selina, I, I, you know, I, you actually I took away the question that I was going to ask because you kind of explained the Hurun in, uh, in terms of, um, you know, maybe being a little bit asexual, um, which I thought was, you know, which is what I was going to kind of ask you. But, you know, when we talk about companionship, what about the companionship that we have here on earth vis-a-vis -vis there? You know what I'm saying? Like, would your yeah. families be transferred there or something? You know, could you comment on that? Yeah. So it it seems the way the the way the Quran talks about paradise is that it it says that even hardships between people in the world in paradise those hardships will kind of be erased so that they're only saying peace peace to each other, and so that was always fascinating to me that there is some type of reunion with those people who we have um, like beautiful intimate relationships with in, in this world and family relationships. And so there is, it's interesting, whenever the, the Quran is talking about the likeness of paradise, it's, it seems to be saying you know, there's a resemblance to this world in, in this here and now but that it is that it is different it has a it has a different character so it's it's um you know there's there's definitely like a reunion with the people we love is definitely part of the islamic you know aspirations for paradise but it seems that the reunion makes the relationships even better like even good relationships here on earth then in in paradise they become even better because there's no any trace of animosity or, you know, even as we, we talked about in this series, right, spouses can have conflicts and, you know, I asked you to pick up this and you forgot it or, you know, whatever it is, even good relationships can, can have moments of tension. And so it seems that, that relationships in paradise, those, that is um, completely erased, um, inshallah. Well, that sounds good. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> It's uh, here, let me stop. They're here. You know, the thing is that because we are in Ramadan and people are going for Tarawiyah, I think everybody's in a little bit of a hurry. Um, yes. But uh, I, once again, I think if there's no other questions, I will just kind of close the program at this point and uh, thank you again for this wonderful, wonderful series and for everything that you have uh, imparted on us. Yeah, thank you. And I should stress, because some people who hear me talk about how the Quran depicts beings in paradise try to say, I'm not, I'm not saying that maybe there is sexual intercourse in paradise. I'm not saying that there is not. I'm just saying it's fascinating that the Quran never directly mentions it. And we could think of why, why is that the case? But, you know, in, in, inshallah, when you have like this promise of, uh, you know, ultimate, you know, like even better than than what we can imagine. Uh, inshallah, it is definitely definitely that. And inshallah, we we all of us experience experience it. Inshallah, God willing. I mean, I mean, your Rabb. And thank you so much for the series. I um, ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to forgive me for the shortcomings and to reward all of you and to continue uh, the Islamic Center of Boston Wayland, uh, your amazing programs. And may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala accept all of your Ramadan fasting and your Ramadan uh, qiyam, your praying through the night, and um, may Allah put us all on uh, you know the the most beautiful character. Uh, inshallah, God willing. 
Amin, amin ya Rabb. Wa akhir da'wana inna alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillahi. Our, our last prayer is um, for praise of God all the all the worlds and um, peace and blessings upon um, our beloved messenger. Amin. Amin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you to everyone who made this series possible. Wa alaikum as-salam.